Okay, we're going to get started on the concept of oxygenation. Um, this concept is probably one of the most important concepts that you will learn while in nursing school. Um, I know you guys understand that all organs and tissues need a steady supply of oxygen in order to survive, and so um, it is important that you understand what is in this chapter. So just FYI, it is your responsibility to review the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system. Um, I believe when you're studying this information that it is helpful if you look at the patient from the standpoint of is it an issue with gas exchange, airway patency, or a respiratory pattern issue. Remember that you first addressed this concept in pediatrics and now so and now we're going to augment the concept not only in Adult Health 1, but also in Complex Sim. So, let's get started. You guys, this is Module 15, and it does start in your textbook on page 1021. Please take time to review the expected learning outcomes for the concept of oxygenation. This is the stop and do you know slide. At the beginning of each of your chapters in your book you're going to find that there are concept key terms and so for instance for module 15 this is on page 1021 you guys need to stop and you need to go through these terms and make sure that you understand the terminology. Do you know what tachypnea, orthopnea, apnea, dyspnea, hyperventilation, hypoventilation, respiratory depression? Do you know what these mean? Often these terms are utilized in the stem of an NCLEX style question and they offer valuable insight in you selecting the correct response. And so make sure that you understand these key terms. They are listed on 1021, but also if you turn to 1026, you're going to realize that they are bolded. And if you look at 1027, you're going to realize that there is an actual chart that you can review. Also on page 1026, it gets into not just a key term, but a condition, such as a pneumothorax. So what is a pneumothorax? So we're looking right here. Review this on page 1026. A pneumothorax is when air is allowed to enter into the pleural cavity. Then it causes the lung to not be able to fully expand as you can see by the picture. And so you can see that this would produce certain signs and symptoms in your patient. It can happen suddenly. It can happen unrelated to a traumatic injury, which would be spontaneous. This patient complains of pain, difficulty breathing, coughing, and decreased or even absent breath sounds. If we let it progress and continue without intervention, they can have asymmetrical chest wall movement, increased shortness of breath, and a declining O2 saturation. So this is something that we're going to learn about, not just in Adult Health 1, but we're also going to learn about the management of the chest tube systems, which is the treatment for a pneumothorax in complex sim. It's easy to identify how there would be numerous concepts related to the concept of oxygenation. And this is actually on page 1026 in your book, and you can read through this. But it's uh, obvious that it would be closely tied to the concepts of acid-base, cellular regulation, perfusion, and cognition. Um, for acid-base, for instance, with oxygenation, we're learning about arterial blood gases, or ABGs. And so what we realize with acidosis, which you guys are going to learn about acidosis, we realize that there's an increased CO2. And an increased CO2 is called hypercapnia. We know that hypercapnia leads to vasodilation, and we know that this can be bad and cause an increased intracranial pressure. We know that anemia, for instance, deals with cellular regulation. What's anemia? 
it's declining red blood cells. And so we know that this leads to a decrease in oxygen because of the declining red blood cells and we actually have what, co what is a shunt. And this decreases the amount of oxygenated blood that's delivered to your organs. And you guys can read through how it will affect perfusion and cognition. Health promotion. Okay, so we're going to focus on modifiable risk factors. You guys can read through uh, modifiable risk factors of obesity, diabetes, stress, and anxiety. And management of these can improve oxygenation. But what places a patient most at risk for issues with oxygenation? It is the use of tobacco. And we know that tobacco is an addiction. And so we need to make sure that as healthcare providers, we educate patients and their families regarding the issues of using tobacco products. Now we're going to focus on actual smoking of tobacco, but just remember that tobacco comes in many different forms and that the use of tobacco overall increases the patient's risk for certain types of cancer, especially when it is prolonged exposure. And we also do not want to forget that it also increases the risk for certain types of cancers and chronic respiratory diseases, even for secondhand smoke. So we want to encourage our patients, even if they don't smoke, to avoid secondhand smoke. What do we know about tobacco? We know that it is addictive. We know, for instance, that it increases mucus production. We know that it reduces ciliary action. These all lead to chronic respiratory airway irritation and uh, chronic respiratory diseases such as asthma, COPD, emphysema. So when we come into contact with someone who is using tobacco, we want to assess, assist, and arrange for the opportunity of quitting. And so we want to assess. We want to first assess, does our patient use tobacco? If they use tobacco, what form and for how long? So for instance, if someone smokes, we specifically want to know how much they smoke. So we want to document packs per day. And we do this by multiplying the number of packs of cigarettes they smoke per day and so for instance we know that there's 20 cigarettes in a pack right and so we would ask them how many packs of cigarettes do you smoke per day and they might say okay I smoke one and then we could ask them for how long and so let's say that they say it's one year and we know that their history is one pack okay so a lot of times it could be that they've smoked for 20 years and so then they would have a 20 pack history all right so it's extremely important that we document how much and how long we want to assess then after we assess if they actually use tobacco what is their readiness to quit we want to always assess for readiness to quit quit and if so let's jump on it okay let's talk to them about nicotine replacement therapy. We know that nicotine replacement therapy has improved. We know that there are many different forms of nicotine replacement therapy and we want to give them information on the different types. We know there's patches, there's uh, lozenges, there's gum, there's oral medication, there's nasal spray, and so we can give uh, the healthcare provider a heads up that the patient is ready to try and stop and hopefully get them a prescription for a NRT and then also give them information regarding uh, support. We need to um, remember that we can encourage them, you know, baby steps. It could be as simple as just delaying the amount of time between cigarettes maybe decreasing the number of cigarettes that they smoke in a day, 
but we also want to remind, remind them of the benefits of stop smoking, and they are numerous, guys. For instance, the cilia returns shortly after they quit smoking. This is one of the first things that happens, and so their cough should decrease, which then uh, decreases the risk, for instance, of pneumonia. We know that when they stop smoking that it can prevent uh, or lower, I should say, lower the cancer risk, okay? It prevents damage to the new D DNA that's being constructed and helps repair already damaged DNA. And it just goes on and on. So just remind them. And then we want to arrange, we want to arrange for follow-up. Especially when someone's in the hospital. If someone's in the hospital and they're, they're on NRT, they're not smoking, we want to just remind them that they are on their way to actually stopping the use of tobacco products. All right, we need to talk about obtaining a respiratory assessment. You're gonna do so by making sure you do a thorough past medical history and you want to know their functional health considerations. You need to ask them about, you know, current respiratory issues. Do they have a history of respiratory disease, lifestyle, smoke, use of tobacco products? Do members in the household smoke? What do they do for a job? Is there exposure to pollutants? Uh, ask them about the presence of a cough. Also, ask them have they had any um, chest pain, any risk factors such as we talked about, and certainly ask them about their medication history. You want to make sure that you ask them about the use of inhalers, Sabas versus Labas, nicotine replacement therapy, any meds that they would consider meds to ease their breathing. Ask them about their most recent flu and pneumococcal vaccines. You guys can review the table that goes over assessment for oxygenation. You learned this in the first semester and it was reinforced in the second semester about the assessment methods. Um, you're gonna want to go over the chart on 1031 and 1032. When you're looking at risk factors, we already said that you needed to talk about family history as far as risk factors. You also want to ask them about their weight Many chronic diseases present themselves in weight loss, so make sure that you understand if they've had any recent weight loss, weight gain, and if it was intentional. Also ask them about activity intolerance. Sometimes people lose track of what they used to be able to do, so be specific. Ask them about what were you able to do a year ago, what are you able to do now, has it changed significantly and then ask them about dietary habits. Okay, when you go to do a respiratory assessment, just a reminder that you're going to use inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. These should be familiar terms. And you know, for instance, you're gonna inspect the nose. You're gonna look to see, um, are the nasal passages symmetrical? You're gonna inspect the chest rise and fall. If you suspect that the chest rise and fall might be abnormal, you can actually place your hand for uh, palpation and, and palpate if the chest rise and fall is symmetrical. Percussion really is something that is used for advanced practitioners, and percussion a lot of times is used to actually identify a change in the pleural cavity and if there's any fluid in the space, any kind of solid masses in the space. And then you guys are quite familiar with auscultation, and you know that you need to be familiar with the diff different types of adventitious breast sound. Okay, let's talk about diagnostic studies for someone who is having oxygenation issues. So under blood studies, we have the concepts of ABGs. You guys know that there's a separate explain everything for you to review and that you need to learn your normal values and ABGs. Uh, pulse oximetry obviously is not a blood study, 
You guys have learned about pulse oximetry. You know it's non-invasive. You know it's painless. You know that it measures your O2 sat. Uh, can, you know, detect changes in your O2 sat. Your book says 95% or greater is normal. At this point, when someone has an issue with oxygenation, you need to look at their baseline and compare it to their baseline. We know that O2 sats can have variations when someone has fingernail polish on, they have varnished nails, patients moving, poor perfusion, carbon monoxide poisoning. Moving on to sputum studies, you know, someone comes in, they have pneumonia, we need to understand what type of bug is causing it, then we need a sputum culture. We know that sputum cultures are best obtained in the morning, you know, the organisms have had all night to brew, we get the patient to expect expectorate into a cup, you know, is it bacterial, is it fungus, is it virus. If the pathologist decides to do a cytology smear, they're looking for abnormal cells such as cancer cells, and AFB is checking for the presence of tuberculosis, so that is your acid fast bacillus. And what we know from the acid fast bacillus is that those are sputums that need to be obtained three consecutive mornings. We know that PFTs are your pulmonary function tests. These tests are administered by a respiratory therapist and they have very patient specific instructions. These instructions could include to not smoke 12 to 6 hours prior to testing, to not use your bronchial dilators. Um, they're helpful when a patient has had changes related to ventilation or lung volume and capacity. We often get PFTs for an individual who we suspect might have asthma, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and then PFRs, PFRs uh, peak flow rates or peak expiratory flow rates a lot of times is what you guys will hear. Uh, this test called, it's usually done independently once the patient is educated and it is done at home with a peak flow meter. And peak flow rates tell us about the patient's day-to-day -day status as far as how they are doing and if they require any additional medication or their maintenance medication is working. A lot of times, peak flow meters, we tell the patient that they have zones. They have the green zone, the yellow zone, and the red zone, and they're given very specific instructions regarding the different zones. As far as, like, for instance, the green zone, which is 80% or better, then your medicines are working, you're good to go, you don't need any additional medicine as compared to the yellow zone, which could be a reading of 50 to 79% of your best average uh, peak flow rate and that you are getting a little bit worse you might need to add a quick relief medicine such as a bronchial dilator or a saba in your red zone which is below 50 percent of your personal best you're not doing well this signals a medical alert and you need to call your physician and receive direction when we're looking at a vq scan a v Q-Scan is a invasive nuclear medicine scan. It uses a small amount of radioactive material to examine both the ventilation and perfusion in the lungs. Um, it is used to check for evidence of a blood clot or what we would call a pulmonary embolus. You guys know what a chest x-ray. As far as a pulmonary angiogram, this is also an invasive test and it is where a small amount of contrast dye is injected into the blood vessels and that is either done via the groin or the arm and the dye then will light up and show us any tumors, any blood clots. This is someone though, if someone's going to have an angiogram, whether it be a lung or a pulmonary angiogram, that we need to make sure that they do not have any allergies to the contrast that's being injected and to make sure that they do not have um, a poor renal function. Uh, a lot of these contrast um, materials are eliminated through the kidneys, and so we just need to check the BUN and creatinine to make sure that we're good to go. And then the last thing is a PET scan. 
A lot of times PET scans are used for the detection of cancer. Uh, it again uses a tracer. The tracer is a radioactive substance. It's usually attached to something and it specifically looks for disease in certain tissues. And so we would be doing a PET scan, for instance, to detect lung cancer. Uh, a lot of times PET scans are superior in detection over your MRIs and CAT scans as far as showing how well the lungs are working and how well lung tissue is working. Okay, and bronchoscopy. So in general, scopes can be used to visualize many different structures and areas within the body. They're a great diagnostic tool. They can be diagnostic and therapeutic. Scopes in general have the ability to visualize structures by using a light but they also have two other channels that allow you to insert, for instance, in a bronch, if you wanted to lavage someone because they had mucus plugs, you could insert saline through the scope, and then it also has the ability to suction out the mucus and the saline. Someone who's gonna have a bronch has to be MPO, obviously, we're going to uh, have the test performed by a pulmonologist they're going to insert the scope down through the mouth, through the trachea. They can easily visualize the vocal cords and then go into either the left versus the right side of the lung and often they go in both sides. They can locate, for instance, if someone is having a bout of pneumonia and they have mucus plugs that are causing impaired gas exchange, they can lavage and get the mucus plugs out by suctioning. It can also be utilized, for instance, if there is a suspicious chest x-ray, PET scan, MRI, CAT scan, and let's say, for instance, in the right, like lower lobe, they can use a bronch to go down, visualize the area, and then they can insert a biopsy forcep through the scope and take a bite out of the actual tumor or mass and that's what's occurring in this particular slide when you guys are looking at this you guys can see for instance that this is bloody more than likely it is because they have gone in and taking a bite of tissue from this cancerous tumor and then they will send this off to pathology and they'll be able to diagnose now during a bronch often a patient is giving sedation to help them relax and be able to tolerate the procedure. But something else that they do is they often numb the cough gag reflex. They do this a couple of different ways, but this is what's important. When this patient comes back to you, you have a couple of different concerns. One, they've received sedation, so you want to make sure their vital signs are stable. So let's get a complete set of vital signs, check their O2 set, check their orientation set status, and two, we want to make sure that they can actually swallow um, effectively. So people who come back from a bronch often have a set amount of time that they're MPO. And they are MPO because of their depressed gag reflex, cough reflex. So the first thing that you give them once this MPO status is up should be really water. Because if they would possibly aspirate, then they're aspirating water. And so just make sure post-op that you understand that the patient is going to be MPO for a certain amount of time and you need to check vital signs and their neuro status. If biopsies were involved, then yes, it is possible that the patient will have blood tinge sputum additionally. Additionally, a procedure a patient could have that has issues with oxygenation is a thoracentesis. A thoracentesis is a procedure that actually drains fluid from the pleural cavity. There are many different reasons that a patient might experience accumulation of excess uh, pleural fluid in their cavity. When you look at this particular photo, what you realize is that as the excess pleural fluid collects, it allows less space for the lung to actually expand, and this interferes with breathing. And so this patient is known to have what we call a pleural effusion. The larger the pleural effusion, the more difficulty the patient will experience breathing. 
And so often a thoracentesis is done at the bedside, but they might go down to invasive radiology and have a thoracentesis done with like an ultrasound, for instance, so better visualization. They will have a thoracentesis and it will be left versus right side. So obviously, when we're looking at this lady, she is having a thoracentesis on her left. The best positioning for a patient who's having a thoracentesis when they can tolerate it is sitting and leaning over a bedside table. This allows collection of the fluid in the lower pleural space and then is easier to obtain. There is a video connected here that I would highly encourage you to watch. When someone has a thoracentesis, then they're awake, they receive no sedation, they receive some local numbing medicine, and then a large bore needle is introduced in between the ribs into the pleural space, and then the fluid is drained. This fluid will be sent to pathology for a variety of tests. It just depends on what they're looking for. Post thoracentesis, a patient will cough. The reason the patient coughs is it helps to re-expand the lung. So this is normal and the patient just needs to understand that they're not going to be able to control the coughing. You also need to realize that post thoracentesis, the patient needs a chest x-ray. We need to make sure that the lung did not collapse and we need to make sure that the lung actually re-expanded. And then you will need to make sure that all the ordered diagnostic tests of the pleural fluid are sent to lab. You'll place a dressing over the site and you'll watch the patient's thoracentesis site for any excess drainage. Okay, so independent nursing interventions. Remember, those are the ones that you can uh, put into practice without a physician's order, all right? And so when we're thinking about independent interventions, remember when we were talking about the concept of oxygenation, I said you guys needed to look at it from the standpoint of is this a gas exchange issue, a respiratory pattern issue, an airway patency issue, and that can help guide your independent interventions. So first, uh, let's actually talk about positioning. Uh, in your book on page 1035, it talks about the difference in Fowler's and High Fowler's. It gives you a couple of um, pictures. Just remember, High Fowler's can be a difficult uh, position for those individuals prone to skin breakdown. But if necessary, we certainly want to use it. When we're looking at the orthopnic position, we're actually looking at the position where the patient is sitting on the side of the bed and leaning over a bedside table, or they could be in a high fowler's and lady leaning over a bedside table, and this position could actually help with chest expansion. Uh, when we're thinking about positioning, just envision you walk into a room and someone complains of being short of breath, you notice that they're tachypnic and that their O2 sat is declining. And so you're thinking to yourself, okay, I will get a full set of vital signs. I will check what their O2 sat is. I will compare the O2 sat against their baseline, what they normally run. I will, if allowed, set them up into a Fowler's or a high Fowler's position. And I will encourage them to breathe deeply. Okay? And these things actually help to improve oxygenation. So when we're breathing deeply, just have the patient close their eyes, encourage them to relax, encourage them to put one hand on their chest and one hand on their abdomen. Encourage them to take a deep breath in through their nose and when they are exhaling, what they should feel is that they're pushing their hand on their belly out or they should feel the hand on the abdomen rise more so than the chest. And we could encourage them to breathe out through pursed lips, like we're whistling. And this, a lot of times, is known as abdominal breathing, or belly breathing, or even diaphragmatic breathing. Okay? And we encourage them to do this like three to ten times just dependent upon what exactly they are experiencing. Uh, when we're talking about clearing secretions, we've talked about um, the fact that sometimes, for instance, someone might have excess mucus production. 
they might have mucus plugs, and we need to teach them some coughing techniques. And so one coughing technique that we teach individuals, for instance, with a COPD is what we call a huff cough. And that's just really forced coughing at the end of expiration. So we, you know, encourage the patient if they can, sit up. We encourage them to breathe out slowly and completely and then take in a slow, deep breath, hold their breath for a couple of seconds, tighten up their abdominal muscles, and then as they force the air out quickly, then cough at the end of the forced exhalation. And that they could do this, you know, three to four times. And this should hopefully help to loosen up some secretions. Your book actually talks about suctioning techniques. And these suctioning techniques will actually be addressed in complex sim. Okay, so the suctioning techniques will be addressed in complex sim and they will actually be, um, we will show you how to do those. Okay, and then we want to monitor our patients for activity intolerance. And so just not only can we do that, but we can also encourage the patient and the uh, significant others to monitor the response. And so, for instance, let's say that you have a um, patient who has asthma, and they're in a hospital for an exacerbation. Then we would want to encourage them to monitor and record their peak flows. Uh, we want to understand, do these people need a SABA or a short-acting bronchial dilator before they actually exercise? And we also want to encourage them to alternate periods of rest and activity. Okay, collaborative therapies are therapies that you need a doctor's order. Okay, so for instance, the healthcare provider is going to tell us about the patient's diet or their nutritional needs. And so what we know is that some chronic respiratory diseases do require an increase in calories. Uh, the issue, the patients often lack the endurance to consume these additional calories. And so we need to suggest small, frequent, high-protein meals, and if they're having issues with um, tenacious secretions, we need to encourage um, them to increase fluids and this will help to thin secretions. Uh, pharmacological therapy, we will approach when we talk about the exemplar COPD. Many of these you did cover in pediatrics. Uh, we need to talk about bronchial dilators, when to use a SABA versus a LABA. We need to talk about the use of steroid therapy in the exacerbation of chronic uh, respiratory diseases, and also when we use anticholinergics. Um, sometimes we need to add something for allergies because that's the culprit behind the respiratory disease. Uh, incentive spirometer, and incentive spirometer is really just a lung exercise that uh, we encourage patients to do. It helps uh, encourage lung expansion and causes some uh, post-operative issues such as atelectasis and the development of pneumonia. So if you do not know how to instruct a patient how to use an IS, please review the video that is attached. Oxygen therapy, you guys learned about oxygen delivery systems or devices in the first semester and so please review this material and also know that in the um, folder for the concept of oxygenation on the YouTube video, there is a posted video that you can review. Chest tube management, this is something that we will actually learn about, or maybe we've already learned about in Complex Sim. And then ADGs, there are two videos in the folder on the YouTube channel. In the folder is the concept of oxygenation, and you guys need to review these, and we will actually do a worksheet uh, to solidify this knowledge in class. Just a review about some of the things you learned in pediatrics regarding lifespan considerations. Um, you guys know that infants and peds have a faster respiratory rate and an increased metabolic need that we need to figure out. That the uh, eustachian tube is uh, relatively shorter, more horizontal, and this leads to increased incidence of otitis media or ear infections. Tonsils are larger. This uh, enlarged tissue causes potential airway obstruction and increase in infection. Uh, more flexible larynx, one that's not quite as rigid, 
uh, makes more uh, susceptible to spasm and airway obstruction, a higher infection rate, and that as these infants and toddlers uh, mature, they have increased immunity with age. Challenges with the older adult, we know that, for instance, the chest wall stiffens and that the rib cage does not expand and contract as well as it used to, and that the diaphragm weakens, and these lead to an increased incidence of infections. We know that they have a decrease in the immune system overall and antibodies, ciliary function, cough and sensation in the pharynx. And yeah, this leads to an increase in infections, but it also leads to an increased risk of aspiration of secretions. And um, we know that their respiratory control system or their nervous system is not as responsive to changes in the body such as hypoxemia and hypercapnia, and so therefore this patient is not going to respond and compensate as quickly as someone who is younger. Okay guys, that wraps up the video for the concept of oxygenation. Just a reminder that if you feel like you need additional help, there is a video on respiratory assessment and then one for oxygen therapy review. And certainly you need to look at the videos that are posted about arterial blood gases. Okay, I look forward to seeing you in class.